transition for us from our panel to our next speaker who's going to speak about linguistic servingness. And so Dr. Rebecca Becky Chavez is the inaugural senior director of retention and support services at Front Range Community College. She previously served as the inaugural, inaugural director of the TRIO Student Support Services Program and the inaugural director of admissions and outreach at Front Range Community College. Boulder Admissions and Outreach at Front Range Community College, Boulder County Campus in Longmont. She has been at the college since 2008. Becky is a first generation college student who grew up in the rural community of Milliken, Colorado and received two bachelor's degrees, one in liberal arts and one in history from Colorado State University, Fort Collins. We'll forgive her for that. Just <laughs> A master's degree in history from New Mexico State University and a doctorate in education at the University of Colorado at Denver in leadership for educational equity in higher education. Before her career in higher education, Becky taught high school social studies at Valley High School in Gilcrest, Colorado. While at Front Range Community College, Becky helped establish the Latin X Excellence Achievement and Development Scholars, the LEADS program for Latinx students on campus to see their culture and experiences as an asset to leadership development. She also was a main driver in the creation of designated bilingual positions at Front Range Community College, starting with the first one in 2011. There are now over 20 designated bilingual positions across the college. Rebecca is also a founding member of the Colorado Coalition for the Educational Advancement of Latinx. <laughs> that group was known as COSIAL and is a part of the leadership team for Front Range Community College's Emerging Hispanic Serving Institution Task Force. So outside of Front Range Community College, Becky has served on several scholarship and community-based boards, as well as enjoying time cooking and reading and trying out DIY projects and spending time with Familia. So let's all welcome Becky, Dr. Becky Chavez. Research on Linguistic Servingness at an emergency, Emerging HSI. This is the first time I'm presenting this to people other than my committee members and my family, so I'm a little bit nervous. I have to face my fear of speaking to get through it. So that's why I'm sitting here. I'm super excited also to learn how you've already been implementing this in your work 
and or new ways that you may want to implement linguistic servingness where you are at today. When I started thinking about my dissertation topic, I was focusing more on the impact designated staff have on students and community members they work with. With the COVID pandemic though, gaps in service and support were identified in all the sectors of how we support our communities, and it's also true with how we support our staff. As I saw things unfolding at work, my focus shifted to how designated bilingual staff have been supported, and while this is the focus, my research and recommendations can be applied to the student experience, to community organizations, and beyond. So, here we go. So, my dissertation topic focused on bilingual staff has a direct impact on the connection to my language story. I'm a Chicana and I am a part of the first generation in my family to not be brought up speaking Spanish. I grew up in the Millican and Johnstown area, way up north, and it was a fraction of the size that it is today. I am that person who drives around Colorado saying, I remember when all of this was new. <laughs> because it was. My family roots are mostly in northern New, in New Mexico, from Raton to Santa Rosa to Clovis to Hurley, and my maternal grandma came to Colorado from Brownsville, Texas, Texas when she was a little girl. Both sides of my family came to Colorado in the early 1900s, there when there was a need for the migrant workers to work for the Great Western Sugar Company in the beet fields. So we have now been here for seven generations. On my mom's side, my grandpa Frank and my great uncles played baseball for the Greeley Grays on Sundays when they had the day off. I had to throw that in there. Mm -hmm. Eric goes by. <laughs> my parents divorced when I was four, and my sister and I were raised primarily by our dad. Our dad had this fun thing during COVID of, hey, let's recreate this picture. Oh. <laughs> so that is my dad, my sister, and I. And 40 some odd years later, there we are again. <laughs> my sister has been my best friend since I was a senior in high school, and she paved the way for us to go to college. Together, the three of us are unbreakable. We grew up next door to our grandma and grandpa Chavez, who helped raise my sister and me. Our grandpa Chavez was able to get a job with the railroad and was threatened with physical harm by his boss when he was caught speaking Spanish. When my dad started school, he had a tough time because Spanish was the primary language spoken at home. And it was because of this discrimination our family faced in rural Colorado that assimilation was cho chosen over acculturation in raising our generation. I am somewhat proficient in understanding Spanish uh, when I hear it spoken and I freeze up with fear, anxiety, and shame when I am expected to speak it. I tried learning Spanish in college but I don't do well with English grammar and trying to learn Spanish grammar put a stop to my academic learning of Spanish. I struggle with this part of my identity, the not knowing. I have been told I am not enough because I don't speak Spanish by those from my own community and from some white people I have encountered who know Spanish, oh, you're Chavez by marriage and not by birth. All this is a part of why I was a part of creating the first designated bilingual positions at Front Range Community College, and why I wanted the voice of these positions to be heard throughout my research. So why designated bilingual staff? The term cultural broker and designated bilingual staff are used interchangeably in my study. This is a definition of a cultural broker or staff based on the literature I reviewed. They are someone who acts as a go-between, who advocates on behalf of another individual or group to help students and their families or supporters navigate the complicated process of going to college, as well as challenging systemic barriers that minoritized students face in higher education. They are not just serving as interpreters because they know the language, but they are serving as cultural brokers because they have shared lived experiences with the community they are working with to correctly translate and interpret in a way that is culturally appropriate. When I started at Front Range, 
Almost 16 years ago, I was tasked with regaining the trust of the Latine community, work that continues today. I went out to the community to establish relationships so they, they knew they could trust me and the college. Over time, there was a sense of trust, trust established, and the community shared that what their needs were with college staff and leadership. One of the stories that kept coming up was ensuring that people who mattered more than our processes, and that when Spanish-speaking families came to campus or engaged with us at a community event, there would be someone who could explain the complicated process of higher education in Spanish who could connect with them. In 2011, we created the first position um, in my department, and it was designed to support students and families and their supporters with interpretation in all areas of the enrollment process not just in education, but in financial aid, in admission, anywhere across the college. And they were expected to translate resources into Spanish at the same time. After the 2013 flood that happened in Northern Colorado, gaps were identified by community leaders in emergency response and flood recovery that directly impacted the Spanish-speaking community. In 2016, the city of Longmont received a grant to identify barriers in the community. And one of the results was a greater focus on the vital role that bilingual cultural brokers serve in outreach efforts. This work was shared throughout communities of Boulder County and greatly influenced Front Range's focus on growing bilingual staffing positions at the college. This video clip, clip was done by that group, Resiliency for All to highlight the need for cultural brokers and the need to support the work they do. I have enabled captioning, but it only shows for the Spanish speaking parts. The video does translate English to Spanish and vice versa in captioning, depending on the language of who is speaking. So let's hope this works. soy inmigrante, entonces eh, yo puedo comprender lo que las familias están pasando y hay una gran diferencia entre los, la cultura americana a la cultura de los de nuestra. Our mission is to help reduce human suffering during a disaster for all people. But that strategy piece of understanding where the pop population shifts are, what are the language and cultural barriers we gain that from um, working with our cultural brokers in different communities. We, I think, as an organization, have really embraced the you know community input aspect of this, and and, and and really trying to be very focused on utilizing those cultural brokers to bring information in that we may not normally consider. Entonces necesitan contratar yo siento que personas que realmente conozcan la 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 cultura, que que sepan quizá. No sepan mucho inglés, pero siento que sí tienen que invertir. Si esa persona sabe la cultura, es más fácil conectarte con la comunidad. Es difícil cuando una persona que aunque habla español, peor aún si no lo habla, uh, entra a la casa y no sepa la cultura. There's been numerous occasions when my bilingualism and culturalism has helped me tremendously overcome situations where it could be uncomfortable. But when you are able to communicate with them, when you're able to let them know that you're kind of one of them, basically Ted brings all those barriers down. I think the challenge though is that the county then comes to rely on a few cultural brokers and you know I think of people that uh, I, I know several people who are called to be everywhere all the time dealing with issues and, and that's a challenge. When you are a cultural broker, the, the demands are high. Uh, you have the language, you have the, the cultural knowledge. But at the same time, you have to be aware of the, the amount that you're going to be asked to do different things uh, and pulled in different directions and what that's going to cost you personally. You know, when you're working with a family who's in crisis and you're in an office and they say, can you come out and translate real quick? You know, I'm, I'm the counselor, I'm not the translator. The work, I mean, for me, Seven in the morning, sometimes you leave there at seven at night. That's a 12-hour day. 
es que no hay el personal suficiente para poder ayudar a esta situación. Son muchas personas, muchas familias. Para una persona que sea bilingüe o culturalmente competente, es muchísimo trabajo. We're valued, but we're under resourced in the sense that we need to develop more cultural brokers. We need to develop more opportunities for leadership. I mean, that's one of the things that came out of the resiliency focus is, you know, yes, we need to do a lot of infrastructure system change, um, but one of the big things is how do we develop leadership opportunities for the up and coming generation, right? How do we create more cultural brokers that can work with um, both the immigrant community and, and the native Latino community as well, make sure that they're not left out, make sure that, it's a, it, that, that they are being addressed and their needs are being addressed as well.
third element is cultural relevance and competence, which means to cultivate a culturally competent environment where linguistic diversity is valued and celebrated, and where staff members are trained to effectively engage with diverse cultural backgrounds. This means that, oh, my font changed too. <laughs> it did. It did it not first, but it just did. That's why it looked weird. Okay, sorry. Sidetrack rabbit hole. <laughs> this means the institution shows that it is intentionally committed to the work that needs to be done in becoming an HSI, as well as work focused on equity, inclusion, access, and social justice. The fourth element is community engagement and responsiveness, which means to cultivate a culturally competent environment where linguistic diversity is valued and celebrated and where staff members are trained to effectively engage with diverse cultural backgrounds. This means that the institution shows that it is intentionally committed to the work that needs to be done in becoming an HSI, as well as work focused on equity inclusion. Did I just read that? No, it just, it just sounded similar, sorry. I'm nervous. Did I say that? <laughs> the fourth element is community engagement and responsiveness, which is to engage with the community to understand their linguistic needs and preferences and actively respond to those needs through tailored programs, events, and support services. This ensures that families feel involved and engaged in the community journey of their loved ones. The final element is the elimination of language barriers and stigma by creating an environment where individuals feel comfortable using their native language without fear of judgment or stigma, and where efforts are made to bridge language gaps and promote language learning and exchange. This means there is an environment at the college where individuals feel like they belong, where employees represent the community, community the college serves, and the individuals feel welcome to speak Spanish without shame. participant stated, I don't want to feel judged for speaking my native language. I am proud to be bilingual and I would like to embrace it and be able to speak it openly without others thinking that I am talking about them. I want the bilingual students to feel comfortable and safe for speaking their native language. For both staff and supervisors, the elimination of language barriers also includes expanded educational access by offering language related programs and resources such as English language learner programs and dual language class formats to build facilitate educational access and success for speak Spanish speaking individuals. It also values validating the intersectional identities of students by providing identity based coursework, coursework such as ethnic studies, Latino studies, and Native American studies to empower students from minoritized groups to create a more inclusive campus environment. Here's the Mentimeter again. Does anybody need to log on? And I can put it back up when we're having the table discussion. So now is the time. Take a few minutes to talk at your table about the examples you have thought about and how you have already implemented Serviness and any ideas that come to mind. As you're talking, add your thoughts to the question that it will pop up once I get into that screen. Um, and you'll start seeing them pop up live as people are entering information in there. And then I'll read a few of them at the end.
wrapping up your conversation, but you can still add. of my research. You are going to hear me talk a lot and I apologize for that already. But the, my, my research centers around stories and storytelling. So when you're hearing me speak, it is not me. It is the words of the people who participated. So the purpose of my study was to understand the lived experiences of designated bilingual staff and supervisors of these positions as well as to institutionalize the structure and provide support for these roles. My dissertation started and ended with the value of confianza or trust. When looking at confianza in the sphere of higher education, its meaning expands to include responsibility, mutual respect, mentorship, teaching, and learning. It becomes a space where future college students and their family and supporters and the community begin to explore the possibilities of what college, a college credential can mean to transform the lives of individuals from minoritized communities. It becomes a space where frontline higher education professionals become the guide for future students in their higher education journey by sharing their own stories of navigating systems that were not built for them. It becomes a space where frontline staff are developed into future leaders by supervisors who listen, who honor culture and experiences, who advocate and who provide an environment where staff can be authentic in their service to students and the community. The creation of designated bilingual positions would not have been possible if the community did not trust front-range community college 
and that the institution was not there to check a box to say they were there, but that they were being intentional about this work. The foundation of my study were the stories shared by participants. The survey questions provided participants the opportunity to share their stories of why they do the work they do, the challenges they have faced, and provide recommendations for the future. This narrative, this testimonial or storytelling approach is a method researchers use to center the voices and experiences for the community they are studying to enact change. In my study, the voices of the collective participant groups were recorded in their words and not mine. Storytelling in the work we do as students and in the communities we serve is a way to connect with one another, to identify the things we have in common and where we experience where our experiences and beliefs are different. It is a moment of vulnerability where you are sharing a piece of your experiences with others to create a safe space where those you are working with have a sense of confianza, of trust with you, and where they are more comfortable asking questions, which is really hard, and asking for help, which is even harder. It can inspire others to know that they can achieve their goals too. For my research, I didn't present participant stories individually, but as a collective, weaving the voices of participants together and telling the story of each group to inform recommended changes that Front Range can make in supporting designated bilingual staff and supervisors of these positions. The collective recounting of the story shared with me also protects study participants' anonymity. Storytelling allows communities to dream together, grow together, and trust each other in solidarity, create different stories that give us hope. In my review of the literature, I found that not a lot of research exists specifically looking at bilingual staff in higher education, and I had to draw from other areas such as counseling, healthcare, and the K-12 work with migrant families. I focused my research on organizational culture and ways institutional leaders can support diverse staff at predominantly white institutions looking at the areas of hiring, onboarding, and supervision. The framework that I developed envisions an institution, institutional culture where trust or confianza, empathy, authenticity, and empowerment are central. Instilling these values from the hiring and onboarding process for employees ensures that their cultural orientation to the institution is grounded in these tenets. Where the values of the organization are transparent from the start and employees at the college feel that they are able to be a part of the continuous growth of evolution of the institution. For this to become a part of the organizational culture, it needs to be supported by authentic leadership, cultural humility, as well as internal and external community support. Authentic leadership and cultural intelligence are foundational components to the supervisor uh, relationship, to having a community of support and to the individual who is the cultural broker. With an increasingly diverse student body, leadership needs to embrace cultural humility. An organizational culture where employees are able to show up as their authentic selves with their supervisors, and it is a reciprocal relationship based on growth and trust can be established because the work of cultural brokers can take an emotional toll. And a community of support can be found internally and externally. The community provides a space of sense of belonging where minoritized staff find mentors and collaborators in their work, as well as a validation of their experiences from individuals with the shared experiences and beliefs. When I started at Front Range, there were not a lot of people who looked like me who worked there at any of the campuses. I found my, my people my comadres, my third space, the place that is not work or at home, out in the community. If it wasn't for that, I would not be here today. So the, relate, the foundations of theory for my research were first, relational cultural theory, which is, it was established in the field of psychology by a, woman, a group of women and places the value of relationships people create to heal from trauma by connecting with others and is based on mutual empathy and empowerment. It is a shift from the isolating focus on the individual to a community. Relational cultural theory creates spaces where trust can evolve and individuals have a sense of acceptance and belonging that they are able to be their authentic self. 
The next is community cultural wealth, and that is when the experiences and values that individuals have learned in the communities and environments that they grew up in are honored and not seen as a deficit. They are the knowledge, skills, abilities, and relationships that communities of color have used to survive and resist forms of oppression and systems that were not created for them. And then the final theory was psychological safety, which provides a work environment where groups of individuals feel safe and have a strong sense of trust, resulting in an easy flow of ideas and sharing of concerns without fear or embarrassment of retribution. Instead, they are rewarded for being courageous for speaking up. Staff will have the drive to be innovative and continue to learn it in an environment where they feel free to share their voice. One of the benefits of fostering psychological safety at work is having a greater sense of representation, voice, agency, and a sense of belonging. Hmm, there's a thing. Sense of belonging, making sure you matter. And with my research findings, I had three research questions that are the foundation of exploring the experiences of bilingual staff and their supervisors to gain greater insight into how supported and connected to others they feel in their roles. Their feeling of psychological safety to be able to share concern and provide recommendations for improvement without fear of retaliation. And to recognize the strengths staff bring with them to their position because of their lived experiences. There were two groups, those who were designated by the staff at any time and those who supervised these positions at any time. And I would have used it interviews, but because of my positionality at the college, I got had surveys done with open-ended questions. So what I got is all I couldn't ask questions like, why did you feel this way? Why did you think this? How could we improve stuff? Um, because they didn't allow me to talk to them. So I still don't know who participated in my study. Um, but it was really hard for me to sift through the stories and experiences that were shared by them because I wanted to make sure to share their story and honor their voice with those who they chose to share it with me, with you, and eventually with our community at the at Front Range Community College. The first research question was how do designated bilingual employees perceive their work, environment, and support for their role in serving students and families? The study showed that the work that designated bilingual staff do has a deep personal connection to their cultural background and experiences. For four designated bilingual staff participants, the role as a cultural broker went beyond supporting young students with Spanish interpretation. They are also able to share their experiences as former students at the college. For one former student, their identity and representing their culture is what inspired them to work at the college. I am a first generation DACA student. I've been with the college for many years as a student, a student employee, part-time worker, and now in my full-time role. It's important for me to represent my culture and background so that my story can inspire others. And I found that roughly 45% of those who have been in designated bilingual positions were previous students at Front Range. So unknowingly in creating this environment, our students wanted to stay and be a part of the organization that had helped them to achieve their goals. When an environment is supportive and creates a sense of belonging, they want to come back and do more. Building trust and relationships was a value that designated bilingual staff shared about the work they do. Their experiences are what help them to relate to the students and families they work with. Trust is the foundation for families when they are learning about going to college. For first-generation college students and families new to the United States, it's not only the student who is learning about college and how things work, but it's their whole support system learning with them at the same time. Having somebody at the college they can connect with and trust is key to shifting any fears they may have into opportunities for the future. For this participant, being able to speak to students and families in their native language creates a space where they feel more comfortable asking for help and are able to more easily express concerns, frustrations, and fears. Connecting with students and families means that designated bilingual staff are being vulnerable by sharing a piece of their higher education journey with others. With storytelling, staff can also gain a stronger sense of who they are 
as they create a counter-narrative that highlights the strength of their experiences and inspires others to know that they can achieve their goals too. And being able to speak Spanish and having shared experiences allows, oops, Um, allows Desmond Ray legal staff the opportunity to connect with those they are working with at a different level because there is a sense of trust and belonging. These staff members possess valuable navigational capital, the skill to maneuver through complex educational systems, and they use this knowledge to guide students and families, ensuring they can successfully access resources to achieve their goals. There are also times when designated bilingual staff face barriers in the work they do, such as not having a sense of belonging, and feeling like there is a lack of support. Staff said they face a lack of understanding and support from their coworkers, leading to feelings of isolation and questioning their value at the institution. When staff reflected on their challenges, what is frustrating is that I'm not able to express my feelings. The barrier students go through, sense of belonging in certain departments and even campuses, and most importantly, not knowing who I can trust at the institution, staff members, and administration. Another staff stated that the most frustrating thing is wanting to help and there not being enough help in Spanish for them. This specific community needs more resources. For designated bilingual staff who do not have a sense of belonging, a sense of trust, and who feel like they are feel like they have to validate the work that they're doing, there is a risk that they are going to get burned out or leave their role at the college. As Aaron said, there are now 22 bilingual designated bilingual physicians at the college. 19 of them were created since 2020. So you have that gap between 2011 and 2020, or yeah, 2020 until we saw them really grow and be valued at the college. For the supervisors that participated in their study, um, they were really about advocating for the creation of the positions because they saw that the demographics of the student population that surrounded our campuses and the increase in college access events, someone was needed who could communicate with the families in Spanish. So there was a need. It wasn't just the stories. We looked at the data. So we had the qualitative and the quantitative to piece everybody's right and left brains. Supervisors value the unique perspectives and experiences that designated bilingual staff bring, which challenge their own assumptions and help them become better leaders. One supervisor said that they value designated bilingual staff ability to connect with prospective students and especially their families to establish a high level of trust and sense of belonging and learning about their ideas of how to best serve our Latinx population. I also value that their passion for what they do is based on their own experiences in becoming a college student. Because learning doesn't just happen from the top down, it has to happen from the bottom up for anything to change. The community cultural wealth that designated bilingual staff bring with them to their roles becomes a part of the foundation for transformational change that can happen at Front Range or in the institution. Supervisors recognize that bilingual, designated bilingual staff are able to be the guide for students and families navigating higher education because they have been where they have been and they continue to challenge the systems that often act as barriers for those they work with. One supervisor said, it was also very exciting to see the bilingual staff feel an even stronger sense of paying things forward to help students who are in similar positions when they went to college. They didn't have the same kind of transformational support of a cultural worker when they were students. For supervisors, there was a sense of pride to see former students become higher education professionals to support the development of designated bilingual staff. Hiring them into the position at their alma mater honors the student experience and validates their work as higher education professionals. One supervisor said, selfishly, I also value that I have learned, well, all that I have learned about being a leader and by supervising those who are in these positions. It's so cool to have our previous students come back and have a passion to work for the institution they once attended. There was a consistent message in supervisor responses to the questions asking about the most challenging part of supervising designated bilingual staff. 
a sense of helplessness. Advocating for designated by, by, designated by language staff not only comes in the form of creating positions, but also to ensure they are supported ones in their roles. When we are valued for the number and not the experiences, it's hard to show administration the value of personal connections, belonging, and trusting communities. Um, when designated bilingual staff have negative work experiences, their supervisor should be a trusted person at the college who will listen to them and guide them in working through these situations. Fortunately, staff reported that they did have a positive relationship with their supervisors and could talk to them. Supervisors felt a sense of helplessness when trying to escalate issues faced by designated bilingual staff, as the institution has not always been responsive. One supervisor shared their feelings of helplessness. It is a chal it's challenging to hear these experiences, but more so to live with them. It sheds light on how prevalent systemic oppression is and how silently it operates. Having a psychologically safe and supportive environment were core to bilingual staff having a sense of belonging. This was represented in different ways. For one staff, it was a third space in meeting where they were the only designated bilingual staff member. I was able to provide feedback in an honest way and advocate for my students' needs. Another found a trusted space outside their department where staff was able to make them feel available to hear them vent when they felt unwelcome at the department. Having a positive relationship also contributes to staff for being able to be innovative because somebody believes in them. Having a psychologically safe and supportive environment or core to designate people with staff having a sense of belonging. For one staff, it was a third space in a meeting where I just did that one. No, I didn't. Designated bilingual, sorry. Designated bilingual staff often feel they value their work is not recognized by the institution when they advocate for more resources. It is meant to, met with inaction and a participant stated that they saw there was a need for interpreters. Sometimes the challenges of having a sense of belonging come from external entities. One participant shared a negative experience they had with the parent. One time while in a, on the phone with the student's parent, they proceeded to tell me that my accent was too heavy and they could not understand me. They also told me they wanted to speak to someone in America and not in Mexico. Mm -hmm. It is clear that bias is evident in various interactions that designated bilingual staff have with internal and external constituents. FRCC is making sure to bring these positions and ensure that staff have a safety net when they experience overt racism and discrimination. Supervisors creating and fostering an environment steeped in psychological safety during the good times helps provide a strong foundation for, of support for designated bilingual staff when unpredictable bad times and experiences unfold. Supervisors overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly said that having a cultural understanding is key in supporting their staff. One supervisor stated that without cultural understanding, supervisors will not be able to create a supportive environment or advocate for what is needed without this understanding. At FRCC, designated bilingual staff are less than 1% of employees. Out of 1,500, they make up 1%. One supervisor stated that having that they have observed that Spanish-speaking students often seek out these staff members regardless of their role at the college. I have seen this student sought out as a staff member who could speak Spanish, which gave him access to the same level of support experienced by his English-speaking peers. The difference is all staff speak English, so these students who speak English have more places to turn to when they are stressed. Supervision is not just about the daily operations of the department and making sure staff are doing what they are supposed to do. It is also about seeing the assets that staff bring with them to their roles, honoring their stories, and making sure that they have the space they need to feel safe and supported. With a positive relationship, supervisors are able to recognize the challenges and emotional impact designated bilingual staff may experience when supporting students. 
Conversations with students who experience discrimination based on their identities or language skills may have a much more intense impact on the designated bilingual staff as it may be something that they have experienced or something that they relate to much more personally than other folks who work with these students. Designated bilingual staff reported feeling supported, supported, encouraged, and welcomed by their supervisors. They appreciated having supervisors who share their cultural background and provided resources to help serve the Spanish-speaking community. And being expected to do more and a lack of action were two of the negative experiences designated bilingual shared about their experiences with the supervisor. This included being asked to volunteer more often than their non-bilingual counterparts, and a lack of action from leadership was a concern for another participant. Leadership is all talk and no action. Staff stated that they shared that they didn't receive any formal evaluation on the services they provide in Spanish. They didn't. They did overwhelmingly though feel supported by their supervisors and listened to. For one staff, this meant feeling that they were seen and heard. Another participant found a safe space meeting with their supervisor one-on-one -on -one, where they have created a space to share those experiences. A positive relationship between a supervisor and supervisee begins with confianza, empathy, and mutual learning. Both sides need to be able to be authentic, have trust in one another, and care about the person, and not just the work that they're doing. When designated bilingual staff are not evaluated on the work they do in Spanish, that is a large part of their work that is being invalidated and silenced. Designated bilingual staff responded that the evaluation they received from their supervisors was general and didn't specifically center on their the services they provided in Spanish. One of the supervisors in the study, none of them had command of Spanish, and instead relied on observing nonverbal cues and having open dialogues provide feedback and support for bilingual staff based on the staff's self-evaluation of themselves. So they were evaluated on how they thought they were doing. Supervisors who participate in this study don't possess the language skills that staff do or know what it's like to be one of the few designated bilingual staff working at a predominantly white institution that is predominantly English speaking. They do, however, empathize with their staff and care about their staff and value the work that they do. They aim to create an inclusive and equitable work environment, shielding designated bilingual staff from being overburdened and supporting them when facing microaggressions or discrimination. I think of shielding them from being too asked to do too much because of their ability to speak Spanish. In my experience, I have had to support bilingual staff in dealing with microaggressions from colleagues and folks they have worked with at schools and in the community. And from all of that are five recommendations that the institution can do to make things better for designated bilingual staff. Again, from them and supervisors. The first recommendation was that most prevalent from both staff and supervisors was a need and importance for professional development opportunities. Staff indicated that they lacked access to professional development opportunities to help them grow in their positions and to provide the best support for those that they are serving. Supervisors wanted to see more supervisor training in general and more diversity, equity, inclusion, and access training for everyone, and training on how to do better to support designated bilingual staff. The second recommendation is recognizing the value of multilingual employees. The demands of designated bilingual role combined with low pay and potentially limited advancement opportunities can contribute to burnout and high turnover rates among staff, posing a risk to the continuity of support for students and families. Supervisors also recognize that their staff are often pulled away from their job duties by others to interpret for other areas, sometimes at the last minute, to provide support to Spanish-speaking students, parents, or community members. From the responses of supervisors who participated in the study, they felt a sense of duty to protect their staff from being overextended in their role because there are not enough staff to meet the daily demand of Spanish-speaking staff at the college. 
This recommendation includes providing compensation to all staff who are proficient in other languages. Front Range has had a, have, has had a 5% higher starting pay for designated, designated bilingual positions, full-time, part-time, and for our student staff. We have always done that. And then some municipalities, such as the city of Longmont and the Boulder County, they like the actual county, not the campus, um, have different compensation for how often people use Spanish or another language. Um, and then when seeking support externally or outside, some with typical job duties for interpretation or translation of materials, ensure they are compensated for their work. For students, it could be pay, it could be apprenticeship opportunities, it could be internship opportunities, but they do need to be compensated. It is also a good investment to purchase simultaneous interpretation devices if you haven't done so. That has come up a lot recently for us. The third recommendation is to create a more inclusive working environment. While designated bilingual staff provided examples of spaces and experiences that gave them a sense of belonging, being heard and valued by their supervisor and having a third space to connect with others to support where they did not feel othered, where they can develop their identity as a higher education professional. Staff shared that they had experienced racism and discrimination from internal and external entities. While supervisors shared that they had advocated for something to be done about these negative interactions and nothing was done. This loss of psychological safety and feeling of helplessness can lead to employees limiting their contributions to innovation and change, as well as advocating for the needs of students and staff. And employees may choose to leave. The fourth recommendation is to have more resources available in Spanish. Designated bilingual staff and supervisors consistently responded that there was still a gap in Spanish resources. One recommendation to address this gap is to extend the number of written resources available and make them easily accessible to Spanish-speaking communities. This does not mean using Google Translate, but the intentional translation of materials taking into account the Spanish that is used by the community being served. As a part of this, it is recommended that a business process be created if it hasn't been done so already for department to have information translated into Spanish and the burden of translating cannot fall slow, solely on designated bilingual staff. And another part of this recommendation is to have more staff to balance their workload to make it more manageable and have more resources for students and families. And the final recommendation is to have formal evaluation of Spanish speaking services and coaching. Receiving consistent feedback from a supervisor is one of the ways staff develop in their roles, and for supervisors to learn about the goals that their staff have in their professional journey. For designated bilingual staff, they're not able to receive feedback and reinforcements on the services they provide students and families in Spanish if their supervisor isn't proficient in Spanish. One recommendation is to identify bilingual leaders at the college, even in the community, who can observe staff in their natural environments where they are connecting with Spanish-speaking community to provide feedback that will help them grow in their position. It is further recommended to examine the work that is being done in these areas of instructional coaching. It could be useful to examine the practice in those spaces for instructional support and create a model for student affairs and staff. So thank you so much for listening.
where I'm presenting this information? Good question. This is the first one I've done. So. So I will be presenting it to our college leadership and then those who may or may not have participated in the study. Rebecca, I think you have to go everywhere where we have a bilingual personal, yeah, because it's only 20 years uh, working for the organization now. I don't do it more speech manager, but I still help on my peers. But what this is, is you want to describe my organization. I was like, when I was the only one, I said, who my clients going to blame you? Oh, that is wonderful. Can I explain to me? You don't know how to do this, you know? So, how? And also, the school, the person, to everywhere, and the other one that I said it. Looking for better pay and more jobs, they don't take so much emotionally and so much trauma. We have post trauma. We're working with a sense of health. What is that work? I was translating for people, the one doing the HIV test, I see. So I was the first person to hear somebody who was raped, because was raped. Somebody here it was Spanish, so was the only student in the other years. And it's very hard. It's very hard. So, of course, I'm 62 years old now, and, and feel so much better. But still, if some business staff they still have it, if we have a now a new group, the immigrants, they come in when the tourists have so horrible. They it's very hard because if you find somebody in a position, they can't speak the language, they blow away everything what they have. And that has to be recognized. I think you really, it's a university, educate health systems, educate school systems, social workers, it, it's a lot. Because yes, it's something that will happen and will happen more and more and more. Yes, thank you for sharing your story with us too. And all of us who are in helping positions, hear those stories of trauma and, and pain and sorrow and we don't know how as supervisors to to help you through those and we need to learn that secondary trauma response so yes and i'll present to wherever you want me i would just like your comments on how this translates to the business world the students are learning you know, to serve in the community, but then if these students are graduating and then moving on into the business world, what, what's going to happen? What do you think? I think for business, because a lot of it is still making sure that they're supported and they're able to, whoever is coming through their door, are able to share their stories. Because in business, depending on what it is, they may be just starting their own business or they may be accessing this resource for a personal reason. So I think a lot of this still contributes to the world of business. It may not just be as fluffy and touchy-feely as it is in higher education, but I think no matter what your field is, how we work with students, how we work with clients, how we work with our customers matters, and how we as supervisors support our staff matters and being able to be who you are in your workspace to the extent that you're comfortable is so important. Um, I wanted to say congratulations on your first public presentation and also <laughs> to our confidence because um, the research that you did is so important and it, I think that it can um, it can and should influence how we are running 
our schools, especially when we have that HSI designation. And so I really appreciate you showing your findings from your research. So my question is, um, the recommendation to pay staff more that are bilingual, I'm not bilingual, but I value my colleagues that are, and um, where do we start in ask, like how did you, what was your starting point for asking for those individuals to be paid more and have it be like just culturally accepted at your school that they were going to get right off the bat 5% more? That started way back when I was meeting with the community and one of my comadres with the city of Longmont, which is, this is ironic. So way back in the day, Front Range actually helped the city of Longmont create a tiered based pay depending on how often staff use Spanish. And it was, for them it's Spanish and ASL are their two languages that they're looking at. So it was actually work that we had done with somebody else that we brought back in for us. And I, I don't know if human resources just arbitrarily picked the 5% or it was a best practice that they had heard, but I was like, here are these positions, they need to be paid more. They said, okay, we'll do 5%. Um, so I'm not sure where that came from, but it wasn't until like 2022 that we started doing the same for our part-time staff and our student staff, because I know we relied on our student staff who were bilingual so much in admission and at the welcome desk and in our phones, and we never were able to compensate them, and now we can. So, but like, look at the city of Longmont, Boulder County, they all have different ways um, of doing that. I have more detailed information in my dissertation as well. Thank you, everybody.